Hi, I'm Heidi Hisrick, and today I'm going to talk to you about ELISA tests, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays. This is one of the most important tests in molecular biology, and it has so many uses for medicine. So there are uses like urine tests for pregnancies when you pee on the stick, that's an ELISA. Another example of an ELISA test would be if you or anyone you know has gotten tested for COVID-19 antibodies. Both hormones and antibodies are proteins, and ELISA tests check for proteins. So if you have an antibody test, they're doing it via an ELISA. But today, I'm going to be modeling a different kind of ELISA, and this is one for antigens. Antigens are also proteins. Before we get to the model that I'm going to make, there is a handout in the description of this video. If you'd like to print the handout so you have a place to take some notes, you can do that. You can definitely do the video without the handout as well if you'd like. So my students and I are learning about a group of college students who are experiencing an outbreak of meningitis, bacterial meningitis. And we need to solve the mystery of who has meningitis and who doesn't and who has the highest level of meningitis. And for that, we are going to be doing an antigen test, an antigen ELISA test. And we're gonna be looking for antigens, which are proteins on the surface of all cells. And that includes bacteria cells. So if you have meningococcus bacteria, there are antigens on the surface and this test will pick them up. And I'm gonna be modeling three different patients. And let's pretend this is the cerebrospinal fluid I already wrote on the cup, um, just ignore that for now. But this is the cerebrospinal fluid of three different patients who we think may have meningitis. ELISA tests can be done on urine or blood for certain things, but in the case of meningitis, because it's a nervous system infection, you actually need cerebrospinal fluid. ELISA tests use small plastic wells. I'm using large plastic cups to represent those wells. So each patient has had their cerebrospinal fluid added to their well, and then we are going to remove the excess and rinse with a buffer solution and see what's left. The plastic wells in an ELISA test are treated to allow proteins to stick to them. So you can see in this first sample, there are some proteins stuck to the well. In the second sample, there are also some proteins stuck to the well. And in the third sample, there are some proteins stuck to the well. We have millions of proteins inside of us. Are these the right proteins though? Are they the antigens to meningococcus, the, the target antigens? And we don't know that yet. We just know there's some proteins stuck to the well. Also to the naked eye, we can't see anything at this point, which is the reason why we still have to do some more steps. So we added the samples and maybe there's antigens stuck. And the next step is to add another chemical. And this chemical is called the primary antibody. And I'm representing the primary antibody with some lovely micropipette tips. So first I am going to put them in my initial sample and I'm gonna rinse, rinse, rinse and see if anything sticks. Doesn't look like any primary antibody stuck. Of course, I couldn't see that with the naked eye. Um, so for right now, these would all look the same, but none did stick. Now let's try my second sample. Add all my primary antibody. You gotta give it a little time to conjugate. Conjugate just means stick, by the way. So the antibody I added is an antibody to meningococcus. That is the only antigen this antibody recognizes, and so it's gonna ignore any other proteins. That's why in the first cup, even though there were lots of proteins, it didn't stick to any of them because none of them were meningococcus antigens. But in this case, it found one meningococcus antigen and it stuck. Now we'll try our final sample. Again, I'm gonna add the primary antibody. We give it a little bit of time to see if there's a reaction and then we rinse, rinse, rinse with buffer. Rinse a little more with buffer. And those antibodies found some antigens. But to the naked eye, we can't tell any difference between these yet. So we have some more steps to do. So the primary antibody stuck to the antigen. 
but we can't see anything yet. So now we need a secondary antibody. The secondary antibody will look for any primary antibody, and if it's there, it'll stick. And the secondary antibody has an enzyme attached to it, and that's gonna be important for the next step. So we're gonna add our enzyme-linked secondary antibody to the first sample, and then we're gonna rinse, rinse, rinse with buffer. Nothing stuck. Then we're gonna add it to the second sample. Rinse, rinse, rinse. Oh, a little bit stuck. So it found the primary antibody, and then we're going to add it to our third sample, and I bet you can guess what's gonna happen this time. If you've been paying attention, give it time. We're gonna rinse with our buffer, and there is our enzyme-linked secondary antibody. So the enzyme-linked secondary antibody is sticking to the primary antibody, which is sticking to the antigen. There's more of everything in this cup. There's a little bit in this cup. There's none in this cup, but we still can't see the difference yet. Final step. This is where you finally get to see the results visibly and know what's happening. So we're gonna add the substrate, and the substrate is going to search for the enzyme attached to the secondary antibody. And if there's any of this enzyme, the substrate will attach to it. So we add the substrate to the first cup, and you can guess what happens. We rinse, 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 nothing, but at this point, we can now see a color change. So we can see that this has a clear color to it. That means this patient is negative. There are no meningococcus antigens, or at least not enough to be detected by this test. So if there are any, it's a teeny, teeny amount. Now, let's try the same thing with our second patient. After rinsing, a little bit of the substrate stuck which means that the well changed color now because there is a chemical reaction between the enzyme and the substrate. So this is the moment of truth where you get to see if there is any antigen. We can see some color to this, so that tells us there is some amount of antigen in this sample and this patient is positive. I'm gonna call this one slightly positive. So a mild level of infection could be that they just weren't exposed to very much or they're at the beginning of the infection or toward the end of it. Um, but they don't have a super high level. Now we're gonna do our final sample. We will add the substrate and see what happens. We have our final result. So if you look at this compared to the last one, we had a lot more antigen, which meant that a lot more primary antibody stuck, which meant that a lot more secondary antibody stuck, and it had a lot more enzyme on it, which meant that a lot more substrate stuck, and when that happened, we got a lot more chemical reaction. So one thing that's great about an ELISA is you don't just get a negative or a positive. You can actually see qualitative differences between the positive results, and we can quantify those differences, which I'll show you how to do in a later video. And now, I challenge you to create your own model showing what happens in an ELISA test. Come up with what you want to use for your antigen and then for your primary antibody and your secondary antibody with the enzyme and your substrate and then your color change. I would only model a positive result. I did the negative so you could understand what was happening if it was negative, but for the model, you could just do a positive. And if you would drop me a comment below, let me know if this video helped you understand Eliza or if you made a model, I would really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching and look for videos coming soon on serial dilutions and how to interpret ELISA results. Have a great day.